everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. The topic for this webinar is Reducing Electric Bills in California Multifamily Affordable Housing with Solar Plus Storage. This webinar is a presentation of Clean Energy Group's Resilient Power Project, and we have a number of excellent guest speakers with us today. Our host for this webinar is Clean Energy Group President Lou Milford. And before I pass it over to him uh, to get the webinar started, I'd like to go over just a few quick housekeeping notes. All of our attendees for this webinar are in listen-only mode. This means that you can hear us, hopefully, but we can't hear you. You have a couple of options for joining the audio portion of this webinar. You can either call in using a telephone, or you can connect using your computer's mic and speakers. A very important note, we ask that you please submit your questions as you think of them throughout the webinar by typing them into the question box on your webinar console and hitting send. We have a lot of attendees that we're expecting today. Uh, we're expecting to get a lot of questions. We want to make sure that we get to yours. So please type them in as you think of them. We'll be reading through your questions as they come in. And we're going to try to save at least 20 minutes or more at the end of the webinar to address questions from the audience. So again, type those in as you think of them throughout the webinar. Finally, this webinar is being recorded. You'll find a recording of this webinar, as well as all of our previous webinars through the Resilient Power Project, on our website at resilient-power.org. With that, I'd like to pass it over to our host for this webinar, Lou Milford. Thanks a lot, Sam, uh, and thank uh, you all for uh, listening in to this webinar. It should be a really interesting uh, work around uh, a new study that we collectively did with a number of very uh, uh, important uh, California groups. Let me just describe Clean Energy Group very quickly. We're a national nonprofit. We work on clean energy and climate around the country, principally at the state and local level. Uh, today we're focusing on the Resilient Power Project, which is uh, a project to expand the use of new technologies like solar and storage in low-income communities. Um, especially in affordable housing and, and critical community facilities. This is a joint project of the Meridian Institute uh, and CEG, and it's been funded uh, by a number of key foundations that are listed there uh, on, on your slide. And the next slide just describes very, very briefly um, some of the elements of this project. Uh, our intention is to try to increase public and private investment in these resilient power systems, encourage more cities to develop and implement these systems. We saw what happens um, in disasters like Sandy and uh, severe weather events where outages disproportionately affect low-income communities. Um, uh, the intention is not only to uh, address the resiliency aspects, but also the economic aspects uh, of uh, introducing these technologies into low-income communities, and that's the point of this paper today. Um, and we're also working on a number of policies, and you'll hear about policy programs like AB 693 in California that are designed to advance and accelerate the introduction of these technologies in these important sectors. You'll see there a number of uh, reports that we've done in this area, and the next slide basically just will link you to uh, the website that, um, where you can see a lot more information. You'll see uh, uh, the catalog of past papers and webinars, um, we invite you to take a look at that material. Um, it's all free. So let me just get out of the way here and uh, introduce um, the speakers today, um, and we have a really excellent cast of people here. First, uh, Wayne Waite, uh, who's the uh, policy director, uh, director of policy for the California Housing Partnership Corporation, um, who worked with many of the environmental justice organizations on the passage of AB 693, which is a billion dollar uh, program for solar uh, and storage and other technologies to assist low-income renters. Uh, Wayne is a longtime uh, HUD uh, expert in the development of uh, policies to advance energy and federally supported housing programs. Uh, next is uh, Seth, Seth Mullendor, who's with us here at Clean Energy Group. He's the manager uh, who uh, works on uh, power systems and solar PV applications and battery storage projects, um, particularly um, managing the renewable power project. He came to us from the Union of Concerned Scientists, and he has a master's in civil and environmental engineering from Stanford, so knows a little bit about California as well. Um, next, and, and Sach and, and um, excuse me, Seth and Zach will be kind of tag-teaming the analytical work 
um, that uh, form the basis for this closing the California Clean Energy Divide paper. Uh, Zach Ernst is the uh, Director of Analytics for JELLY, which stands for Growing Energy Labs, Inc., um, which is essentially which has become the software company for the storage industry and for other uh, uh, energy technologies. Um, Zach uh, works uh, with algorithms and simulations and control systems um, to achieve the most commercial uh, benefit from these systems. He also holds a PhD in cognitive neuroscience as I said to him that if we get any questions about uh, brain chemistry we'll, we'll we have somebody on deck to answer those too. Um, and so last is Saj Constantine who is the the Director of Policy at the Center for Sustainable Energy, um, who is responsible for all areas of policy, including government affairs and legislative analysis, analysis and strategic planning on uh, local, state, and regional energy policy. He has a long history and deep experience in energy coming from SunPower and previously worked at the uh, California Public Utilities Commission. So I will um, leave it there with the introductions. I'll be looking through your questions and want to uh, underscore, as uh, Sam said, uh, please send them in as the uh, presentations are made, um, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, but uh, start start knocking out the questions as soon as you have one. So I think that's it for me, and I'll leave it to uh, Wayne. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Wayne Waite, uh, Policy Director at the California Housing Partnership Corporation. Uh, California Housing Partnership is a state uh, chartered um, nonprofit organization. Um, we're focused on providing uh, financial consulting services to the affordable housing providers and the development and preservation of housing. As part of our work, uh, we uh, manage uh, a green uh, network uh, that's involved with the uh, development and support around energy policies within the state. So we're actively involved with the um, uh, investor-owned utilities uh, and with NCPUC proceedings or California um, uh, Public Utility Commission proceedings on a variety of uh, energy fronts. Um, and we're also a national partner in the Energy Efficiency for All initiative. Um, my topic today is AB 693. Um, uh, really not often do we have an opportunity to work on the design of a program affecting long-term uh, energy investments, uh, energy investment decisions by stakeholders in affordable housing markets. Um, AB 693 comes along at a moment when the California is weighing a number of comprehensive um, uh, options uh, for its energy uh, future. Uh, utility companies are updating their policies affecting solar valuation. Energy storage uh, is emerging in the state as a viable strategy for uh, managing energy demands, uh, electrical vehicle markets uh, in California are growing uh, quite rapidly and supported by both public and private investments. Uh, and energy efficiency programs within the state are being retooled to advance a number of initiatives, including the new uh, uh, zero net energy building codes that will come into play uh, within the state. Um, it's also a time when the political tide has turned a bit in California. Uh, we now realize, and, and there's just kind of wide public acknowledgement, that we need um, more efforts targeted at low-income households and communities that have not been fully served uh, by past programs. Um, and so within this context, uh, AB 693 is asking us to develop a 10-year program supporting public investments um, in affordable housing uh, markets. And just trying to advance the slide here. Here we go. Okay, so uh, the key attributes, um, oops, the key attributes uh, to AB 693 is that it's a dedicated resource from cap, cap and trade uh, allocation, so it's not a uh, directly a utility ratepayer funded program. Uh, uh, 693 is targeted very specifically at multifamily affordable housing um, markets. Uh, those are deed restricted properties. 
Um, the program funds upwards of $100 million annually over a period of 10 years. Uh, in short, it's the largest public um, uh, program and support for renewable energy investments uh, in affordable housing uh, in the country. Uh, by itself, AB 693 will exceed the goal set by the White House for clean energy investments in low-income uh, housing supported by public programs. In California, uh, the program could potentially reach upwards of half of the affordable um, housing market, approximately 2,000 properties and uh, over 150,000 uh, rental units, uh, you know, provided there's uh, enough roof space for these solar installations. Uh, what is in, uh, important about AB 693 is that it really changes, I think, um, the uh, conventional way uh, public initiatives, uh, public energy programs um, are implemented. Um, some of the what I call game changers are the, is that this program is really intended uh, to directly address uh, barriers to solar access uh, within uh, California's housing market, and, and California is, I, I think, a, a fairly progressive state with respect to its energy programs, um, but notwithstanding, uh, only 4% of the low-income households within the state had been uh, served by the available renewable energy um, programs. And uh, within disadvantaged communities, um, the top 25% of the disadvantaged communities in, in the state uh, uh, house about 9 million people, and only 6% of those census tracts uh, had been served by um, by a renewable energy system. So there's there's quite a, quite a gap, quite quite a green divide that this legislation tries to um, and is intended to get at. Um, secondly, um, the program deploys uh, a tenant first strategy. This is uh, somewhat unique. Um, uh, within the legislative requirements, it requires that the electricity generated uh, by the PV systems that are supported through this program directly benefit, primarily benefit, uh, low-income uh, households. Tenants, tenants must receive a direct economic benefit um, through the uh, utility tariffs that are established. And uh, within a community context, uh, the program is targeted uh, at disadvantaged communities as well as low-income housing outside of disadvantaged communities, and there are local hire, hiring requirements. Uh, so it's intended to really address some of the uh, job-related issues uh, within the disadvantaged communities. Um, the program uh, really provides a, a, a huge opportunity to transform um, the affordable housing market. It, it's singularly focused on this entire market segment, as I mentioned, uh, the program has the potential of reaching uh, really a majority of the existing and new uh, properties, um, buildings uh, within that market, and uh, it is an important vehicle, I think, to advancing the state's uh, uh, net zero energy uh, objectives. Um, uh, another important aspect, I think, of this program is that just because of its scale, uh, and, and focus, it really offers an important potential to kind of move the discussion along with respect to how we reach um, affordable housing markets uh, and offers the potential for developing new products and financing vehicles. Uh, specifically, I think the level of investments uh, uh, open up possibilities for prepaid lease instruments within affordable multifamily markets. Um, to date, these instruments have not been widely used within this particular market segment. Uh, they are used in single-family markets, but um, um, the prepaid lease vehicle uh, can be quite attractive, I think, uh, to, to this particular market segment. The scale of the program also, also uh, provides some opportunities to attract and leverage uh, equity um, investment and the interest of equity investors. and. Uh, possibly even attracting some uh, uh, energy performance insurance providers. 
um, that, uh, in a sense, can guarantee, I think, the, the energy outcomes of, uh, of some of these investments. And because the uh, benefits provided to the tenants through this program will be uh, provided to them through credits on their uh, monthly utility bills, there's also an avenue for tenant participation and contributions in the um, uh, development and financing of these uh, systems through uh, innovative uh, financing mechanisms like on-bill financing or on-bill repayment. Um, and lastly, uh, for me, I think this, um, this program, this initiative offers an important platform for put, putting together um, a range of integrated uh, energy solutions. It's not just about uh, a singular technology. Uh, within the uh, legislation itself, there are requirements for energy efficiency. Um, it looks like energy storage investments are also possible. Uh, more on that a, a little bit later. And, um, you know, uh, utility uh, companies within California are providing now programs uh, to support uh, EV charging uh, uh, setups uh, within uh, multifamily um, uh, buildings. So there, there's some potential linkages, I think, with some of these uh, other uh, utility uh, initiatives that, that are in play within the state. Um, in, importantly, um, Senate Bill 350, uh, also enacted last year in California, uh, increases the renewable energy portfolio within the state and, all, and sets some important re requirements, I think, for advancing uh, and increasing energy efficiency uh, in existing buildings. And so the, the AB 693 can have an important role, I think, with, it, with respect to the future um, of energy solutions within the state. Um, and and how, um, how will enter, uh, AB 693 be implemented? Well, there's, uh, uh, these programs are implemented through proceedings that are implemented through our and I'm having tr trouble here with the, here we go, okay, uh, are implemented through proceedings that are administered by the California Public Utilities Commission. Uh, so there's an active proceeding underway. Uh, we're hoping that this pr uh, initiative or this program gets uh, taken up shortly. Some of the key issues that we'll be kind of wrestling with concern the in in administration of the program, uh, Third-party administration um, is, is possible. That is, that it doesn't need to be a utility-administered program. Uh, there could be, uh, for example, a statewide administrator, uh, which may open up some uh, good possibilities to really leverage some of the economies of scale that uh, that are provided through the through this program. Um, Another area that will be covered in the proceeding is really the project scope. Uh, as I mentioned, energy efficiency is included. We, we need to define really what that means and, and the scope of energy efficiency improvements that will, will be incorporated along with the, uh, the PV investments. Um, there's also a, a role for batteries here. Uh, and, um, and then there's some other questions uh, that um, uh, also need to be taken up. A, a number of the uh, eligible properties are within urban areas um, with, with limited roof space. And so there's a question about how we can reach, uh, through again, through this program, uh, residents within uh, these buildings that have really limited, uh, limited opportunities. Um, there's some core questions regarding how the benefits of the program will be distributed. As, as I mentioned, the program is, is focused primarily on uh, low-income tenants. The electricity must be provided primarily to those tenants, but, but to provide the right incentives for um, the, um, the low-income uh, housing providers or property owners, um, it's important to kind of balance, I think, some of that, that, those issues with the um, questions about uh, common air, how to serve common areas and whether common area systems can also be incorporated within, within the program design. So issues like that will uh, be taken up. Um, the legislation sets some requirements with respect to uh, cost controls um, in, in some of the previous uh, programs. Um, not, perhaps not surprisingly, solar costs for those programs did not, 
decreased despite um, you know rapid declines in solar costs uh, across across markets throughout throughout the U.S. Um, and I think a, a way to get at that is uh, intended by this legislation is to um, align the uh, incentives that are provided through the program with the actual solar costs, uh, resources leveraged, and contributions from from the property and and tenants. Um, there's also an important com consumer protection focus uh, for this program. Um, affordable housing uh, faces a number of uh, financial risks. It's uh, fairly vulnerable, I think, to uh, to changes, and and so it's important that the uh, expectations for these programs actually do, do get realized. And so, mitigating to affordable housing and tenants is a priority. Getting accurate uh, financial forecasts that don't misstate or inflate. Uh, savings um, uh, b because of some uh, business interest um, uh, is is going to be an, a, a really important issue. Uh, and in addition, additionally, the legislation calls for performance guarantees uh, to be uh, pr provided um, for third-party owned systems. So, how to address that? Uh, there's some opportunities, I think, to engage uh, energy performance insurance markets. I think within this program. Uh, and so a number of these issues, I think, are, are, are worthwhile uh, getting at. And then lastly, I, I think preserving the value of the energy markets is um, an important issue. Um, we, as I mentioned, there are new utility tariffs uh, in play. Um, the, the them two requirement uh, says that uh, as um, uh, for the for the new solar systems, once the net metering caps are reached, uh, the property must opt into a, a time of use structure. Uh, the, these time of use structures are now being changed to uh, focus on peak periods that are, in a sense, later in the day. Uh, you know, when it's dark and solar systems aren't in operation. So that's going to really change the the value of of these systems and and just the. the some of the financial outcomes. So addressing those issues, um, and that's a particularly important segue, I think, with respect to uh, storage. Um, as I mentioned, I think we think that uh, the sto storage, energy storage, uh, can be included. It was certainly the intent as we were drafting this legislation to include energy storage systems within the context of these investments, um, because these uh, energy storage can be integrated uh, uh, quite well with with PV, um, the final language uh, is ends up being a bit ambiguous. Uh, but notwithstanding, we think that it it meets some of the criteria and conditions called out in in the legislation, uh, and so we think that uh, it 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 can be included. Um, why it should be included uh, again relates to these time of use uh, issues. Um, there's this transition to moving these rate structures to later peak periods. So what what you have is um, higher cost electricity at times where the the PV systems uh, not you know in a sense not operational because it, because it's dark. So. Um, um, they will, you know, th this kind of dynamic, I think, changes the uh, the financial outcomes. I think uh, of the system. So if you're if you have solar being valued at twenty three cents during uh, during the day, but your uh, peak period is costing you forty five cents um, when the solar is not operating, um, uh, th this could be, in a sense, a game changer with respect to the um, um, you know the financials for for, for the project. Um, and then just to conclude, um, I, I saw this quote uh, uh, in a piece of, uh, that was written about Inconvenient Truth, you know, some time ago. Uh, the quote is that it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. Um, the context uh, with respect to Inconvenient Truth was, was on big oil. But I think the caution um, is also appropriate with respect to AB 693. Um, most of the time, our ability to think about energy solutions is driven by um, singular interests or, or 
business uh, interests or uh, whether or not uh, your utility company or or are you know advocating for a particular solar business model. Um, I think AB 693 can alter that dynamic um, and to serve the really the intended beneficiaries of AB 693 we need to elevate our interest and and focus on broader issues affecting uh, energy use and uh, ec and economics. Um, so with that, uh, Samantha, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, so I'm going to pull up uh, Seth's slides now. Seth, passing it over to you. Thank you, Sam. And uh, Wayne, thank you for that background on AB 693, uh, which is, of course, why we did this study, to uh, make sure that we were uh, maximizing the benefit that we could get for this public investment in, in affordable housing. Uh, and thanks to everyone for joining us here. Uh, I'm going to get into some of the actual analysis and the results that we got through that analysis. I'm going to be joined by, by Zach from uh, Jelly to get into some of the more technical details of what was done since they're the, the group that actually did uh, the majority of the, the analysis work. Uh, I wanted to also let you know that the, the report is available as a handout uh, in your, your um, sidebar there in the webinar screen and is available on our website. Uh, it's publicly available if you want to use that as a reference uh, or just you know, let us know and we can send you a link to that. So, as I said, what we were doing was we wanted to look at what was the value of solar systems alone in multifamily affordable rental housing in California uh, versus what would be the value if you added storage. Uh, in, in this case, we looked at battery storage uh, to these facilities to see if there was a larger value that could be achieved through a combination of the two technologies. As uh, Wayne mentioned, you know, the, the definition that says solar energy systems leaves it open for not just solar, but for combined systems that utilize solar um, in the same way that the, the IRS uh, authorizes the investment tax credit, the ITC, for storage, for uh, solar and storage systems that where energy storage is considered to be an integral part and is mainly charged by the solar system. Uh, so in that same way, uh, we want to look at storage here, saying that that can be part of an energy system, and it could provide a total, uh, you know, benefit to the affordable housing sector more than just solar alone. Uh, and that was the impetus behind this analysis. Uh, what we looked at was um, basically we analyzed nine multifamily affordable housing properties. Uh, those were across uh, California's three investor-owned utilities. Uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, uh, San, uh, Southern California Edison, and San Diego Gas and Electric. Uh, and, and those are the, the major utilities in California. They, they cover 80% of California's utility customers and uh, represent 70% of the state's existing affordable housing rental properties and units. So this covers a broad swath of California and, and a lot of the, the area we're targeting here. Um, we worked with a couple of housing developers to get utility interval data for these properties. So this is actual 15-minute interval data for energy demand at these uh, properties, their electricity utility interval data. Uh, and we used that um, to model what it would look like if we uh, installed solar systems and then solar and storage systems. And for the analysis, we, we used real-world data and real-world utility rate structures. So this is looking at the conditions that these facilities would have today if they were to install these systems today under their current rate tariffs. Uh, in the analysis, we looked at both tenant loads, uh, electricity loads, and the building common area. In the, uh, my presentation today and in the report, we focused on the benefits of storage for common area loads because under today's tariffs, um, Tenants don't have the same value uh, proposition that you do for the, the commercial tariffs that the common area building loads uh, have. So buildings have something called demand charges, 
which I'll get into a little bit more later, that energy storage can target, which solar does not do a great job at. Uh, right now, uh, residents of affordable housing are on residential rates that do not have demand charges and, for the most part, do not have time of use rates that, uh, that Wayne was mentioning. Now, in the future, that's going to be changing, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Um, but for now, I'm going to focus on the benefits to the um, property owners through the uh, commercial electricity usage. So first I'm going to present the key findings of the report, and then I'll go through, walk you through an example of what this looks like for one property and, and show you what it looks like for the rest of the properties that we examined. So we found that adding battery storage to a solar installation um, can eliminate the demand charges for building electricity loads. Um, this is because in some buildings, you're able to actually switch to a utility tariff that does not have demand charges if you drop your demand below a certain level. Uh, for a building that had, you know, around $20,000 annual bill, this could be around a, you know, a half savings because the demand side uh, for many of these buildings was about half of the energy bill. Uh, so pretty significant reduction. Um, you know, in that same vein, we found that battery storage that could double the electricity bill savings uh, achieved over just solar alone. And not only that, but that you could achieve that essential double in savings for about a third of the cost of the solar system. Uh, for example, there's one property um, in San Diego Gas and Electric that we analyzed, um, and to completely eliminate the consumption side of the bill, the kilowatt hour charge, uh, with a solar system, it'd be about a $400,000 solar system, and that would save the property uh, about $15,000 a year. That, those capital costs are before any incentives or anything like that. And again, the uh, initial capital cost of a storage system is about $100,000, um, which could be used to switch the building to a rate tariff that did not have demand charges, and that increased the annual savings to $28,000 which represents a, an 85% increase uh, for a uh, increase in savings for just a 30% increase in cost, which is really uh, quite impressive. And while we found that the, the benefits of storage, combining storage with solar, uh, it varied from property to property, uh, as I'll, I'll show you later. And in all cases um, in our analysis, adding storage to a solar project, it did shorten the payback period of the project. So it provided enough value to the system that it made a better investment going in. Uh, now I'm going to talk about the analysis of, of one particular building in the report. In our analysis, it's SCE1, which is Southern California Edison 1. Again, this is an actual building, actual affordable housing building, multifamily affordable housing, located in the uh, San Diego or Southern California Edison territory. Um, so what you're looking at here is um, just an average of the daily load profiles, and this is taken from the interval data that was provided for the building. It was at least a year's worth of data that was used, and it shows how much energy is demanded at uh, every hour uh, over the year um, by day. So the, the important thing to notice here is, and again, this is for the commercial side, the building loads, and um, the important thing to note is that the peak demand for the building tends to occur right around the middle of the day. Uh, and that aligns very well with solar. It's, it's very good um, so that you can really optimize the amount of, of solar you're consuming and um, really hit those, those peak time periods with your solar generation. Um, and uh, this is just a breakdown of what the, the bill looks like originally for this property. is about $20,000. You can see energy charges amount for about half the bill, demand charges amount about the other half with, with fixed charges picking up some, but, but a number of those fixed charges are actually related to the demand charges. Uh, now I'm going to pass things over to, to Zach. Uh, he's going to tell you about the approach that, uh, that Jelly takes in doing this analysis and, um, and how all that works. Yeah, thanks a lot, Seth. So Jelly's invested a, a substantial amount of R&D into understanding and analyzing this historical uh, meter data, in particular 15-minute interval data, uh, becomes it, it forms the basis for simulating energy storage systems and determining the, the value proposition 
for things like demand charge management, which is, is what we're looking at here. So being able to forecast and predict when a facility's demand is going to spike in order to discharge the battery and reduce that, that peak demand. Um, so building load is, is highly variable uh, and it's, it's dynamic and it depends on things like time of day and day of the week, season, etc. Um, and so we like to start with a site analysis uh, to, to really understand the, the statistics behind the, the building load. So what you're looking at in this slide is a heat map of just the raw data from this particular uh, uh, facility, the common load uh, on this facility. And then that heat map on the left, this is the baseline, an image of the baseline load um, uh, uh, w without any processing. So it's just creating an image out of that load. So what you're seeing is, is the load from January 2015 up at the top through January 2016 uh, at the bottom. Each row is a day in the data set. Um, so going from midnight on the left to midnight on the right. So wherever you see red pixels, that's where demand is high, up at 35 kilowatts, if you look over at the scale bar on the right. Um, and I, I really like these, these images because they, they provide, we call them a facility fingerprint. Um, and, and you can really get a lot of intuition on what's going on in this building. So in this particular building, they have higher demand in the summer than in the winter. So there's uh, probably a significant uh, HVAC cooling load. Um, you can see in March 2015 that there was uh, probably a, 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 hot, a hot wave, heat wave that led to some additional cooling. Um, and you can see in, in January that load kind of shifts from being uh, midday to being in the evening. Uh, presumably there's some electric heat going on. So we take that historical meter data that comes from uh, SE in this case and we simulate uh, a solar system uh, using PV watts or, or whatever the solar developers provide for us. And, and, and with those two together, we can compute what the, the, the net load would be. So on, on the right is what the net load looks like after adding solar. Um, so that trough down the middle of the, the heat map is the, is the reduction in demand from the solar system uh, where black colors there are actually representing negative load, so they're exporting to the grid during that time. And so in terms of, of what this does to their overall peak demand, on this slide um, we're plotting just, uh, in, the, in the first plot, the, uh, at what time of day, and at, uh, so each, each circle is a day in the data set where we are plotting um, what their peak demand was for that day and when it occurs. The red circle is highlighting the biggest day each month. So that top scatter plot shows the, the baseline, um, the baseline scatter, uh, and, and the second plot shows what this scatter plot looks like after you've uh, added this, this uh, solar system. So it's like you've dropped a, a bowling ball through the, the cloud of points and have shifted that demand from you know, midday around 3, 4 o'clock to, to piling up more now in the evening. Um, so as, as we're looking for how to control the energy storage system to now attack those peak events that are shifted out towards the evening, the advantage of pairing solar with storage is that it reduces the time over which you have to discharge the battery system in order to reduce peak demand. So yeah, uh, thanks, Zach. Uh, and I'd just like to point out, you know, you can see here that obviously the addition of the solar um, wipes out a lot of that middle of the day peak demand that occurs. Um, but when you compare the two charts, you see that while a lot of those peak demand events are cleared from the, the middle there, it's really more of a shifting than decreasing what the actual peak demand is. Um, in some cases, it does, the solar is able to reduce peak demand, uh, but it's really just kind of a partial uh, diminishing of that. And if you talk to any financial institution, um, I'll actually say that, you know, you're not going to be able to guarantee those, those peak reduction values with solar because one cloudy day passing through at any time of the month can actually wipe out those values. Uh, but in this analysis, in this modeling, we did see that there was uh, a pretty good demand savings from the solar system. Um, and looking at here now is a comparison between the original bill and original annual bill and what the annual bill would be if you would uh, install the solar system. In this case, it's a, a 90 kilowatt uh, PV system that would completely uh, offset the, the net consumption of the building. So we're looking at 
you know, a net energy of zero for this building. So that's why there's energy savings, it's total savings. Also see, uh, you know, pretty good demand charge savings as well. For a total of 55% uh, savings, uh, you know, just uh, around $11,000 per year that you save with this system. So next, I just want to give a, a real quick overview of kind of what demand charges are for those that aren't that familiar with it and how energy storage plays into that, because that's that going to be the next piece that we're going to look at and next piece of the analysis that, that Zach's going to explain when we're adding the energy storage system into the solar system and that, how that affects demand charges. Uh, so here just is a very simple example. If you look at two buildings, the, the first one on, on the left there, building A uses the same amount of energy throughout the day. Building B uses a fluctuating amount where it's not using that much in the morning, it's using its maximum in midday, which is very similar to, to this building uh, SCE1 that we're looking at, and it uses a little bit less at, in the evening hours. Uh, so those buildings are going to have very different consumption. They're consuming less energy, or building B is consuming less energy over the day than building A because its uh, consumption fluctuates, whereas building A is just a flat line. Um, and in the right, we see, well, what if you add energy storage to this? So if you add energy storage, it can charge up during a time when the building is using less energy, say the, the morning hours, and it can then discharge that energy during midday in order to knock down that peak. So the new red dotted line there would be the new peak demand for this building with that storage, assuming you know this is knocking off the peak throughout the month. Um, just looking at it from like what happens during a day, how does this look like? Uh, this would be you know a, an example of what's called peak shaving, which is this demand charge management. You're looking to shave off those those highest demand events uh, throughout a day and and throughout the month. So in this case, uh, the the original profile is shown there in, in blue, and it would be the red parts as well. If you have a demand management uh, threshold that you define with your energy storage system, you can lop off of those peak events. The uh, battery would be charging during the off hours, but it knocks off of those kilowatt hours during those times. So in this case, it manages the peak demand at 65 kilowatts instead of 100 kilowatts. And you can see, you know, if it was a charge of 10 kilowatts per hour, that would be an annual savings of about $4,000. If it was 20 kilowatts um, or $20 per kilowatt, then it would be above $8,000. And for these um, California rate structures that we're looking at, the demand charges, the, the peak demand charges can range anywhere from, say, $16 to upwards of $30 or, or more. So they're pretty significant, particularly in this market. Now I'm going to uh, turn things back over to Zach to, to explain the next portion of the analysis that Jelly did with the storage system as well. Sure. So we take that historical interval data, and after computing the net load of solar, we then simulate a variety of different energy storage systems uh, uh, on that uh, interval data in order to determine how much demand we can reduce uh, based on the size of the battery system. So in this case, um, we're showing what the, the max demand is for each month of the year um, after adding a, a 30 kilowatt, 90 kilowatt hour uh, battery system. So the, the top of each of these bars is, is where the baseline load was um, before adding solar. The, the yellow bars show what the solar demand reduction is. And then adding this 30 kilowatt, 90 kilowatt hour battery reduces demand further by the, the, the red portion of the bar. So what's left, that blue, the blue bars, is the, the, the new estimated uh, demand charge, or sorry, uh, maximum demand post storage and solar. And so for this particular facility, they're on um, Southern California Edison's GS2 tariff, which if demand drops below 20 kilowatts, that, that threshold, that black line there, that allows them to switch to GS1 which is a uh, tariff that has no demand charges. So that's how using energy storage can, um, uh, can discharge to bring those peaks down below this threshold in order to switch tariffs and, and completely wipe out their demand charges. So then if you take a look at what that actually does to the utility bill, Adding energy storage really knocks out the rest of the bill that you originally saw. Um, you know, we see because we're switching to that new rate structure, 
that Zach was mentioning, we now no longer have any demand savings. We were already offsetting all of our, our energy costs. Um, so now we only are left with fixed charges. We're actually quite a bit lower um, in, in FCE when you're just um, metering for energy consumption. You no longer have that demand charge uh, monitoring or the demand peak demand monitoring. Uh, so you save quite a bit on fixed charges as well. So essentially, you're eliminating your annual electric bill for common area loads and doubling the value of your system um, by adding energy storage. Um, uh, so I want to stress at this point, now I know we're focusing on common area loads. We're focusing on benefits to the building owner. Um, but we realize that the primary purpose of AB 693 is to get benefits to the tenants. So uh, stay tuned. I'm going to be discussing that at the, the end of this presentation, my portion of the presentation. Um, you know, we, we are trying to maximize the total benefit in affordable housing for both owners and tenants very much are looking to the fact that we want to pass these savings along to tenants so that they directly benefit from these systems. Um, to give you a quick look, this is the entire analysis of all nine properties that we looked at. Um, the original bill is shown at the top of each in green. Um, then the bill was with uh, solar alone with, in blue, and the bill was solar storage in yellow. And you can see there's a, quite a bit of difference in how different properties uh, are affected. Uh, you can see in particular the uh, PG&E buildings uh, at the very top that adding solar really knocks down the annual bill for those buildings, which is originally quite a bit higher than the other ones. Um, whereas storage doesn't do a whole lot to add incremental value to the system. And there are a couple of reasons for this. One. Uh, PG&E tends to have higher consumption charges and lower demand charges on their rate structures. So um, just a comparison, PG&E, uh, the, annually their, their highest demand rate is about $16 for, for some of the rate structures we're looking at here, whereas in, in SoCal Edison and San Diego, it's more around in the, the high 20s to low 30 range. Um, also, PG&E has a different demand threshold for dropping down to that no demand rate structure, whereas in um, Southern California and San Diego, that threshold occurs at 20 kilowatts, so 20 kilo kilowatt demand threshold. In the PG&E, it's uh, 75 kilowatts. The buildings that we analyzed were already below that threshold, but it didn't make sense for them economically to switch to a rate that didn't have demand charges because the consumption side was so much higher that economically it wasn't a good proposition. Um, you'll also see that there are um, SEE2 and SDG2. Um, both of those buildings you don't see as low final uh, results for, for the bill. And that's because they were not on uh, their, their demand profile, their load profile was not such that they could actually switch to another rate structure. So there we're just looking at the value that you get through the demand charge management and not through actually switching to a different rate structure. Uh, I'm going to show you another slide and that's another graph. This one gets a bit complicated so bear with me here and again this is all coming directly from the report so you need to take another look at it uh, and take some time to mull it over. Uh, please look at the handout we have here or, or go to our website and download the report. So this is looking at the installed cost of a system, the capital cost, and this is before any incentives. So this is not including ITC or any other incentives. Um, and then looking at the value. So on the left side, those are the, the cost values, and those are the blue and orange bars. Uh, and so blue is the cost of the solar system, orange is the cost of the storage system. And on the right side, you see the annual bill savings. Uh, where the solar savings for solar alone is in green, and then adding storage adds the additional yellow value. Uh, so like we saw in, in the last chart, there's less opportunity in, say, Pacific Gas and Electric, the PG&E territory around uh, San Francisco area, uh, for storage to knock down costs. Um, and you also see that there's a significant difference in cost of the, the solar versus the storage system, um, where 
Well, at most, the storage system costs about a third of the cost. And I want to also stress here that we're talking about this is the, the total initial capital cost. Um, in our economic analysis and uh, how we got to the payback periods that you see above the bars, we then factor into the, the available incentives for these systems. So for both solar and storage, we um, factored in uh, the investment tax credit, the ITC, as well as advanced depreciation, which is uh, advanced uh, is federal depreciation. And on uh, the storage side, we also included the California Self-Generation Incentive Program, which is a incentive program for uh, technologies including advanced energy storage as well as other technologies. Uh, and it provides an incentive level for uh, storage systems, these small-scale uh, behind-the-meter storage systems. Now, uh, Sach, who's coming up next, is probably can tell you more about what's going on with uh, the SGIP program. He's more on the California policy side. But it, it's actually being reworked right now. Uh, so in including it in our analysis, our basic argument is that uh, there is a good reason to have this incentive program in California. California's already doing it. And there's good reason to include an incentive in the storage side for this new program, whether it's through AB 693 or, or some other program. Uh, it's good. It's a good idea to have an incentive for the multifamily affordable housing market on the storage side because it can provide this extra value to the system. Seth, can I just add a little side comment? Sure. So while on the slide talking about uh, uh, these three utilities and the, and the tariffs, these three PG&E sites were all on the, the PG&E tariff A10, which uh, has rather low demand charges. E19 and E20 are PG&E tariffs with much higher demand charges. So buildings that have uh, higher load are usually on those, and, and those provide a better uh, economic value for, for demand charge management. And furthermore, PG&E just recently allowed for the voluntary switching to E19 from A10. Um, so we would have to look in these cases uh, if there is a play for, for switching to E19, which has higher demand charges, um, and whether or not that would increase the, the slice of that, that yellow portion of the savings bar. All right, thanks, Zach. Um, I'm definitely not an expert on all of California's rate structures, so for those of you that are, there's some extra information for you and uh, some other opportunities for solar and storage in PG&E. Um, and that's a good point I want to make here. You know, we, we only had access to a limited number of properties, the interval data that we were working with. Uh, actually, it was a total of, of 14 properties that we had uh, the ability to take a look at. So these are a very small sample of results. Um, we did not cherry pick results out of, say, you know, hundreds of buildings. These are just the ones we had to work with, and um, these are the results that we came out of with that. So a more comprehensive analysis of the value would be a good undertaking for California. But what this represents is that there is a real opportunity for both solar and storage to provide value to multifamily affordable housing. So the actual details of what the economics look like for these systems are all detailed in the uh, appendices of the report. Uh, this is the what the values, the cost, and, and savings look like for SC1, that building. Um, you can see here, as I was saying about the uh, storage system, the installed cost was about a third of the cost of the solar PV system. Um, ITC value for both of those, and quite a significant depreciation tax savings as well over time. Uh, the additional savings is the SGIP incentive, the uh, California Self-Generation Incentive Program incentive. Uh, and so that, you know, that's shown there at the $37,000 range. Um, and you can see the individual paybacks for the solar and then the storage and then the combined solar and storage system. So in this case, you're seeing about a three-year reduction in, in the payback period when you combine storage to the solar system. Now I want to get to really the, the heart of all of this analysis, which is tenant benefits. It's the reason that uh, AB 693 was developed the way that it was, and that's the primary purpose of this incentive money. Obviously, there has to be an incentive for building owners uh, and developers to put these systems on their buildings. Um, so there has to be owner benefit as well, but primary purpose and the main reason for having these incentives is getting the benefits directly to the tenants. So 
as I said in the beginning, because of the rate structures tenants are currently on, uh, while solar can offset their consumption, they don't have rate structures where storage can, can play into it at this time. It's because there's net metering where people get uh, compensated for the full retail rate of the energy that comes from the solar system, uh, regardless of when it's produced. But that, but that is changing. Uh, and um, you know, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, there are several ways for these values to get passed along to the to the tenants, and that will be part of what is looked at as the proceeding continues, as the, the California Public Utility Commission looks at how this program is going to be rolled out and how the benefits can be shared. Uh, so one of the things is that this creates a bigger savings pie for the whole building, uh, the owners and tenants combined. So because there's more opportunity for building owners and developers to save money on their utility bills through the storage, uh, this means that there can be more of the solar benefits allocated directly to the tenants uh, because the owners can see a really nice benefit from the storage system alone. Therefore, more of the solar system installed on the, the building can be going directly to the tenants. Um, you know, and this can enable more participation by things such as urban properties. We, Wayne mentioned before that more densely populated areas, there, there's less rooftop space available, and they, there's often more shading. So there's not as much room on a roof or carports or uh, space around the building to put solar panels. So for buildings that have a very limited solar potential, uh, you can have solar and storage, and maybe the uh, storage side is completely allocated to the building owner, and the solar side is completely allocated to tenants. provides more of an opportunity for those buildings to participate in the program and get the benefits to tenants. Another way that tenants could directly see a benefit is through a shared savings model. Uh, there are a number of storage companies, actually, that provide demand charge management and guarantee a certain level of savings to buildings. Um, this savings guarantee or the actual savings achieved by the demand charge management can be allocated both to the building owner and to the tenants through either reduced rents or uh, directly reflected on their utility bills. Again, this is not where we are at with this report. I um, should have mentioned earlier that this report is actually just the first of three. We're going to be looking at these uh, more in the second report, which uh, we're, we're starting to work on right now. We're going to be looking at, you know, how can this actually be done and how can this be implemented. Uh, another thing that can be done is to apply some of the expected savings through demand charge management to improve the building. Uh, one way is with now having a uh, solar and energy storage system, the building can become power resilient, which means that when there's a utility outage, the building can have power through the combined uh, solar and energy storage resources to power critical loads, to keep on common area lighting, to have charging areas, areas where people can keep medications uh, cooled in refrigeration, can charge mobility devices, the things that people really need to be able to uh, stay in place and weather out a storm, which is particularly important in affordable housing, which often has a a number of residents that are either senior residents or, or disabled residents, um, people that really don't have the opportunity to go somewhere else when an emergency strikes. Uh, the other thing that energy storage can provide is more of a future-looking thing, although not that far in the future, is preserving the value of solar. Wayne touched on this. Uh, the new net metering guidelines show that we are moving to time-of-use rates for residential solar customers. This is uh, very likely going to impact uh, customers that are on virtual net metering programs as well, which are these multifamily buildings uh, where part of the solar is allocated to tenants. As more and more solar comes online, it's more and more likely that the peak periods, the periods where energy costs the most, is going to shift later in the day. And that's going to drive down the value of solar. Uh, solar can actually save that, I mean, storage can actually save that solar to be used later and uh, allow for the, um, the, the, the value of the solar to be maximized. And just one final look at that. Uh, these are actual tenant load profiles. We looked at some for the report um, to, to, in order to get a sense of what the solar system design should be. The thing to note here is that unlike the common area loads, the tenant peaks are already later in the day. They're already at the times where solar is producing less or not much. It's not the peak production time. 
Um, with that, I'm going to sign off and uh, leave it to Sash to explain more about where this fits in the policy situation and, and where California is going with solar and with storage in the larger picture. All right. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Seth and Wayne and Zach uh, and, and everyone attending. My name is Sash Constantine. I'm the Director of Policy at the Center for Sustainable Energy. Uh, we are a nonprofit whose mission it is uh, to accelerate the transition to a sustainable world powered by clean energy. We have uh, several areas uh, of expertise, uh, the, the six you see listed here. Uh, I focus on, on the policy context for a lot of our programs uh, uh, rather than the program implementation itself. And so I'm very pleased to actually talk now a little bit about that context for 693 and the value proposition that you've just heard about. We've heard uh, the, the essentially from the perspective of the building owner, the property owner, and the tenant that there's there's value not only to this this subsidized solar for the low income uh, tenants and residents uh, in, in affordable housing across the state, um, uh, and now. So, so the solar, but now if we think about adding storage to that, we start to get more benefits for those individuals. But there's actually a larger policy context here. Um, I'm going to talk uh, just just broadly about about how this value proposition fits into our, our larger state policy goals. Let's let's start with these points that I have up on the slide now. Uh, California energy policy generally is seeking a number of of results or or conditions. Uh, we want to obviously reduce our GHG and other pollutants. Uh, that's an environmental priority. We want to reduce our dependence on price volatile fossil fuels. That's both economic and, and a political priority, really, and that's, that's California and national. We want to create sustainable markets and job growth in the clean energy sector, part of our, our overall economic policies. We want to make sure, and this is the, the focus of 693, that there's equitable access to these technologies, to sustainable energy technologies. That's a moral and an ethical priority as well as, as an economic and a political one. We also, and, and this, is, this is not necessarily the focus of 693 itself, but we also need to integrate those renewable resources, those clean energy or distributed energy resources uh, into our grid. Uh, we, we need to maintain reliability. That's an operational condition that we, we must meet. And, and you just heard Seth talking a little bit about resiliency. Uh, and and in, a, in, a, in an era when climate change is, is happening all around us, when we face uh, increasing pressures from the environment and demands on our energy system and on our energy resources, resiliency becomes a critical need. So there's additional context for 693. Those, those main points, 693 fits nicely in. It, it, it's going to provide uh, subsidized or affordable solar to, to sectors of our community that might not otherwise be able to, to reach that. But there's a, there's a wider set of specific policies and specific policy uh, activities going on right now. So I'm just going to list them. This is not an exhaustive list. I think it's, it's in, in service of telling the story of this value proposition of how we can close the gap for low-income residents of the state. So looking at what the CPUC is doing, I'm, I'm generalizing here, but they're seeking grid modernization and GHG reductions and other uh, emissions reductions, as well as consumer empowerment uh, in the context of, of clean energy, particularly distributed energy resources. So there are a number of proceedings going on there. We have a distribution resources plan, the DRP, which is really trying to, to create a strike a balance, if you will, between uh, grid planning uh, acquisition or, or procurement and, and consumer facing or consumer oriented uh, uh, allocation of resources or, or, or consumption of clean energy resources. We also have an integrated demand side management IDSM program which is really trying to figure out what the value proposition is for uh, demand side investments that is behind the meter building sited investments consumer consumer driven investments. How do you integrate them and how do you make them valuable? And then finally, there's, the CPUC is looking at uh, MUNO, Marketing, Education, and Outreach. They, they have a, uh, the Energy Upgrade California brand, which is uh, designed to increase awareness and stimulate action on the part of, of consumers across the state. Uh, the CEC, for its part, another important regulatory agency in this space, is focused on energy performance and transparency, at least with regards to, to 693 and the value proposition we're talking about. So 
They manage the Title 24 Part 6 updates. They're aiming, as Wayne has already mentioned, uh, towards zero net energy buildings, and I'll talk in a minute about what that means. They're also uh, implementing the, the AB802 regime, which, which is requiring benchmarking and disclosure. We're going to see uh, efforts to push the performance of our built environment uh, in service of, of the grid and larger policy goals. There's also a number of, of overlapping and interconnected sets of regulations, some of which are already causing those, those proceedings I just talked about, but I'll mention them again here because I think they help set the context, as I said. So SB 350, already mentioned, it, it, uh, it mentions, it calls out market transformation and does, in fact, put us on a path towards a 50% RPS, um, and it really is the current framework for, for why we would want to deploy more solar and possibly more storage uh, on our housing stock, let alone the, the affordable housing stock. AB 32, of course, is our Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006. That, that's what establishes cap and trade, and it sets that cap through 2020. Clearly, this is a policy that needs an update, and that is something that we're really working on. We, we need to make sure uh, that we are updating our standards and our goals, um, not only to match the 50% the RPS, but, but also, I think, the, the uh, ongoing recognition of the, the seriousness and the depth of the problem with, with global warming and GHG emissions. AB 327, uh, passed in 2013, uh, is really about rate reform. It is, the, it is the legislation which authorizes us to move to a NEM successor tariff, to move on from the current full, fully bundled retail NEM to some sustainable successor tariff, and it does in fact, uh, uh, set us on the path to time of use rates and more dynamic pricing. That's a really important underlying uh, signal from the legislature about what the PUC and the CEC and all of us working in the sector need to do with regards to distributed energy resources and, uh, and energy rates going forward. And you'll see in a minute that, that the 693 uh, fits in with 327, and the final bill I have listed here, AB 2514, Nancy Skinner's bill from, from 2010, which uh, set the state on a path towards procuring more energy storage, both utility-owned central resources and customer-sided distributed energy storage resources. All of this, one way to think of what all these things mean and, and, and will achieve together is, is this image of a smart grid. And, and there are many different versions and descriptions of a smart grid, but essentially it's a, it's a smarter system. It's an enabled system which can accommodate distributed energy resources as well as central station. It's designed to accommodate much more clean uh, but variable resources uh, to provide uh, resilient grid operations and to, and to allow us to uh, to reduce the GHG emissions and, and the other negative factors associated with our current fossil fuel generation system. This is also about grid modernization, as I said, and, and making sure that, that our, our lines and our transformers and our distribution systems are, are resilient, they're hardened against, uh, uh, well, they're future-proofed, if you want to call it that way. Um, there are, uh, I'll just gloss over these next few slides, but it, in, if you look at this big picture, all the legislation, all the things that the, the PUC and the CEC are looking at, we, we really have to start figuring out value for, for the grid. We know that there's value from solar, but there's also cost. So we have a number of different ways to estimate value to, to, uh, to co uh, come to some consensus about how we um, pay for the distributed services and how those distributed services pay for the access to the grid. We can equalize benefits, that's things like fixed charges, um, and, and use charges. We can align incentives with beneficial performance. We've done that with the performance-based incentives uh, through CSI, for example, or SGIP, uh, also with the way that we may reformulate net metering going forward. And we can really try to tap into uh, market forces and how, how market can set value through, through competition. Those are not quite as relevant uh, here in the 693 case because we're talking about typically uh, disadvantaged communities, low-income communities, and we, we, we don't want to just leave them to the vicissitudes of the market, if you will. And, and part of this whole vision is, an, is uh, a new idea about consumer choice, so particularly for low income. We, we need to have diverse sets of benefits. We have to offer choices that are good for, for those, those consumers and individuals, but also for society and the grid. So we've heard the, the case uh, for how this could benefit the individuals. I'm going to give you a little bit of the context of how it can how solar plus storage on affordable housing can benefit society and the grid. And, and we need those solutions to be 
optimize uh, for households, for buildings, for the built environment, not necessarily a, a way to create more work and analysis and, and information overload for, for consumers. Uh, there is a, a very important relation for 693 to AB 327. Um, AB 327 does require there is a, a, a special consideration given to, to low-income uh, consumers in disadvantaged communities, and, and 693 is expressly allowed to meet that. Uh, I would contend that that is, that is absolutely correct and proper, but it is only part of reaching out to those disadvantaged communities. Um, solar by itself may not provide the right value solution and is not the only object of, of state's policy with regards to not just low income, but all consumers in the state. Um, so that brings me to this idea of zero net energy. Right? One, one of the things that we're looking for in, in all of this with the, the DRP, with the IDSM, with AB uh, 802 and, and upgrades to Title 24 and all the different bills that I just talked about, we're really looking for deep, deep energy savings. But we need those savings out the consumer side, those buildings uh, where they live and work, we need them to be connected to the grid in a way that helps the grid, that enhances the grid, as well as provides them with, with, uh, with benefits. So we start to think about, and Title 24 is moving towards zero net energy. California has a definition of, of zero net energy that has to do with the, the balance between on-site generation and the value of any energy consumed from the grid. Uh, there's a slightly different definition from the Federal Department of Energy. Um, uh, regardless of that, we have very aggressive ZNE goals. Um, we, uh, we're going to require all new residential construction by 2020, 50% uh, of existing state-owned public buildings, um, as well as all new public buildings by 2025, and all new and 50% of commercial by 2030. These are ambitious. You'll notice that residential isn't, isn't uh, quite as aggressive as we are with public and, and commercial, but I think that the intent is to bring them, those along at the, at the fastest speed possible. One thing to realize is that solar by itself on rooftops is not quite as valuable to getting to Z&E as solar plus storage. And we've known that for a long time. In fact, since 2514 was passed uh, in 2010, um, Governor Brown and many others have noted how important storage is to integrating more renewable energy and making that renewable energy more valuable. See the quote here from Jerry Brown. Uh, in, in, in our view, uh, storage procurement should be guided by three purposes. This is on the procurement side, reducing GHG, uh, integration of renewables, and optimization of the grid. The fourth thing here uh, is that storage can really optimize individual investments and the benefits that they get from these solar installations. Um, and we know, and, and I know this is a bit of a complicated slide, uh, uh, and I, I borrowed this from um, Southern California Edison, uh, but look at numbers 10, 11, and 12. Right? These are all the kinds of values that we were talking about in the earlier part of, of this webinar, what the individuals could gain from it. But you can see that all of this has applications to the actual operation of the grid, and I, I think what we're proposing here is, is both an optimization for the residents and owners of the affordable housing stock in California, but also making those buildings and those tenants and their load and their resources one of the many distributed energy resources that the grid can call on for, for efficient operation. Just to, as a note, uh, we talked about SGIP. I don't have a lot of detail here about SGIP. I'm happy to answer those questions. But one thing is you can see from this data, uh, Solar used to be part of SGIP. It was carved out to be in CSI. That's why in 2007 solar goes away from this graph. Um, and we know what happened with CSI. It grew dramatically, a very, very aggressive curve. Um, the orange that you see that's starting to grow on the right side of this curve, that's the storage. That's the influx of energy storage into SGIP. That's an indication that storage is market ready and viable. It's moving toward the kind of transformational uh, volumes that we saw with, with solar. So st storage is here, and it's important, and it provides all the grids that I, uh, the benefits that I was just referring to. Um, just to give you a sense of, of where we are, I know Wayne mentioned it, and, and, and Lou mentioned it again, uh, AB 693 implementation is part of the, the, the 
NEM proceeding, that's R1407002, or NEM-related proceedings, uh, that, that's a proceeding at the PUC. Uh, all questions related to this implementation, 693 and, and the AB327 alternatives, that's phase two. So we're just getting started on that. Uh, we do expect uh, budget and accounting issues to all be settled out, ongoing work and decisions there. The, uh, the proposed decisions for the AB327 program, or, or, sorry, the AB693 program, uh, and, and the requirements of AB 327 is expected in this quarter, uh, the third quarter of 2016. Obviously, things things get delayed. I know that the PUC has a lot on its plate. This is a very important long-term program. And, and as I've said, it really does fit into the larger context of what we're trying to do, to build an enabled grid that is accessible for all, that provides benefits equally to single-family, middle-income, and market-rate housing, as well as to multi-tenant, low-income, disadvantaged communities across the state. I want to leave you with, with one last thought. And I, I had a fascinating conversation with Lisa Baker, who is the executive director of the New Hope Community Development Corporation out in Yolo County. She, she works on affordable housing. And she really pointed out to me that you know, in, in the period from 1937 to 1940, when public housing was first being built, uh, most homes in America didn't have indoor kitchens or plumbing. They didn't have lighting in many cases. Um, and public housing, essentially affordable housing, was built to new standards that included kitchens, indoor bathrooms, and lights. They were at the vanguard of what housing should be. Central, we obviously are living out uh, here in, in, in the U.S. and in most areas. We have very modern, very... Uh, comfortable homes, but that wasn't taken for granted. We made sure that happened decades, uh, nearly a century ago in affordable housing. We should be doing the same thing here with clean energy, zero net homes. We should be doing that for affordable housing. We should be making sure that these are grid assets, the most modern and useful grid assets that they can be with battery storage and, and solar, making them more dispatchable and responsive to grid demands but also providing the maximum long-term benefit to the tenants of, of those homes. That is uh, a repeat of history, or would be a repeat of history, and, and a repeat that is, is uh, I think, well, uh, a repeat that would be well, well intentioned and, and probably result in, in exactly the kind of public housing that we want and, and stimulation of the market that we need. So I'm going to sign off there and hope that we still have some time for questions. I know we ran kind of long. But uh, thank you all, and, and um, back over to you, Sam. Uh, thanks, Sach. I think I'll take uh, questions and really appreciate everybody's uh, presentations. We have a ton of questions, and about only about 15 minutes to less than that to finish them. I'm actually thinking that the questions are so good. We may want to think about preparing some kind of a paper responding to some of these, or at least trying to answer them if we can in writing to the group. Uh, I'll talk about talk to the speakers about that. We probably have between 25 and 30 questions. So I'm just going to try to group a set of them. Um, we're, we're, we're not going to be able to answer all of them by any means. Uh, there's, sort of, there's a set of legislative questions that I want to leave to, um, I guess, Sach and, uh, and Wayne. Um, one is, you know, is this a billion-dollar program that only four years have authorized to be collected? Uh, I, I'll leave that to someone to answer. Um, and then a related question is, um, you know, if the cap-and-trade auctions disappoint, um, you know, how would this plan and program be structured if there uh, were less funding available? So I'll, I'll, let me throw those two out to Sach and or Wayne to, to answer. Well, I'll, I'll jump right in, Lou. Um, it's important to note that it is up to a billion dollars, so up to 100 million per year for 10 years. Uh, that, of course, that number can be adjusted. Uh, that's one of the things that we're hoping to see uh, in the implementation plan is, is kind of a, a bar. What, what, what does the PUC uh, intend to spend? But the question is, is a good one. Um, it's dependent on the, the, the revenues from the cap-and-trade auctions, um, and, and we've seen some disappointing results recently. I will tell you that I think that's largely uh, the result of some uncertainties around court cases and the legality uh, of the cap-and-trade. I think those are going to be settled. I think people are hedging their bets a little bit at the moment. I also do expect, as I mentioned, uh, um, 
AB32 to be updated this year. I think that's absolutely essential. It's critical to, to the larger framework of, of California energy policy. So I would expect there to be uh, additional revenues coming in past the 2020 timeline. Um, I, I think, though, given the nature of the market and given the, the competing budget demands, uh, we should recognize that a billion dollars is the absolute cap, that most likely, as these things uh, often do, the, the budget will be slightly below that. And we will have to adjust our expectations accordingly. But we can still achieve market transformation. We can still use the money, you, use the budget more effectively if we incorporate ideas like the idea that we're presenting here, combining solar plus storage plus efficiency, plus all of the other DERs that are out there. We, we have a lot of programs. We have a lot of money to work with. We just need to coordinate it very well. Thanks, Saj. Wayne, do you have anything you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, maybe just briefly. Um, I mean, there there uh, is legislation to kind of extend AB 32, um, and so we expect that uh, the, the proceeds that are available under AB 693 to um, – to be extended for for the full full ten year period, um, the, the question with respect to overall funding levels and the uh, the, the poor performance of the May uh, auction uh, it is an important one, and I think it really goes to um, the really the um, the design of the program and uh, the issues that are taken up within the proceeding. Um, it, it makes it all the more important for there to be um, flexibility in, in just the way the uh, financing around these um, uh, these installations uh, it, is structured. Uh, it, it, as Sash said, I mean, it, it is and remains a scaled program uh, that has a, a very deep reach within the affordable housing market, and I think that there is still the ability to attract, attract interest uh, of equity investors uh, in the space. Um, there are certainly opportunities to look at, uh, um, in a sense, innovative uh, financing approaches like on bill that allow for direct contributions from uh, the, the tenants as well as the property owners to make these um, transactions work effectively. So uh, all, all of which is to say it will take, uh, uh, you know, some work and I think some willingness um, uh, among the parties in the proceeding to get into some of the kind of more complicated issues um, and kind of resist the temptation of uh, just opting into uh, a simple and perhaps lower incentive program uh, just so that, um, you know, um, these incentives are uh, available to, uh, to to solar providers to keep to keep solar installations going. Um, I think we just have to spend the time to work through some of these uh, more complicated um, financing issues uh, to um, provide more resiliency in the program. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, I've got a couple questions for you, um, uh, and there are a lot of others, but I, just the one that uh, specifically is. How would the solar or solar and storage benefits work with the utility allowances? Just very much a housing question. I don't know how much detail you want to get in with that. And then how might performance agreements work um, in the context of uh, affordable housing? Okay. Well, very quickly, I, and I think that the utility allowance is a question that we may want to take up more specifically in writing. Um, we, we've undertaken some conversations with HUD uh, with respect to their policies, and uh, I think that there's really an, a willingness to recognize the um, the uh, tenant benefits from the AB 693 installations as a direct tenant benefit, so that, uh, in other words, it w it could be potentially backed out of the uh, uh, utility allowance estimates that are made for HUD-assisted properties. Uh, within the low-income housing tax credit program, uh, those utility allowances are largely set by uh, using PHA allowances. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, th you know, this program would really have no effect on that. The uh, maintenance and continuation of the UAs that are set by public uh, uh, housing authorities could continue and the tenants could uh, continue to um, receive benefits. So uh, we, can, we can elaborate on that 
that answer. Uh, with respect to the performance guarantees, I think we've had some interesting conversations with some uh, energy insurance providers um, that, uh, you know, charge a premium to effectively guarantee uh, uh, energy performance on solar installations, uh, basically production, really, of uh, production estimates. And um, the, the cost of that insur insurance is quite affordable, so I think that there are some avenues where it's possible to um, to provide that guarantee. There are uh, also some solar providers uh, working uh, in the California markets that, that do offer uh, some type of performance guarantee for production estimates that they, um, they're, in a sense, they're representing as part of their uh, uh, deals or transactions with affordable housing providers. So I, I think that there are certainly a number of ways in which um, the performance guarantee requirement under AB 693 can be addressed. Okay, thanks Wayne. Uh, there is also a question, there's a question about whether storage was, is within the legislative intent. I, I don't think we need to get into that in detail. We can address that, but I would, for folks just thinking about that topic, um, they might want to look to um, IRS rules having to do with the interpretation of solar systems under the investment tax credit. Um, the IRS has been quite clear that um, storage um, uh, systems that are charged by solar are considered you know, within the coverage of the solar system definitions under the IRS rules. Um, again, it's not California law, but I think it's, it's pretty persuasive that you want to think of these uh, together as a system. But we'll, we'll leave that more complicated question for another day. Uh, I want to also just see uh, Wayne or Sach or anyone else, do you want to elaborate just on the tenant benefit question, you know, how these benefits um, let's say from solar and storage could be al allocated, equitably distributed. Seth mentioned a couple ideas, and as he said, this is a question we're all going to be working on. But I just wanted to give people an opportunity to just touch on that because there were more questions on that topic than any other. Well, I, well, I think uh, Seth did a good job of out in, in principle many of the ways that those those could be shared. Of course, <clears throat> there are logistical issues and how do you enforce certain aspects of it. One of the ways that we think that at CSE is the most elegant that has worked with our existing uh, low-income solar program, the MASH program, the Multifamily Affordable Solar Housing Program, uh, is the use of virtual net metering. Um, we and, and again, you run problems where you don't have maybe you don't have individual meters in in the uh, affordable housing in, in the building, um, uh, but you can. Where it's possible, you could virtually net meter the, the benefits. You could allocate a certain portion of the, the load or the savings, the offset from the solar plus storage. You could allocate it out to uh, tenants in the building to, to offset any of their bill. Um, I, I think that's that's one thing we would like to see continued uh, under the, the NEM successor tariff is some ability to, to provide a virtual or administrative uh, credits out to individual consumers. You know, beyond that, I think I think Lou, you really you really answered the question. There's there's going to have to be some real work by stakeholders, by by the housing developers, by tenant uh, folks from the utilities, to understand how we can make sure that the benefits of these systems flow to the consumers. We've got to make sure, for example, that the resiliency opportunities are taken advantage of. That the the opportunity to invest in, in uh, better equipment, better plug load equipment, better lighting in, in the building is taken advantage of, that all these things that do accrue to the tenants in terms of benefits, indoor air quality for that matter, that they they see them, they feel them, they, they show up on their bills or in their, their, uh, their housing costs uh, or in, in their quality of life. That's going to take uh, quite, a, quite a bit of work, I would say. Such thanks, and I think we're about out of time, so um, I'm going to turn it over to Sam. But I, as I said, I, th if, I think we'll explore whether you know typically do this. Um, we might be able to try to take these questions. We've got a lot of good ones, um, and maybe put together a short response to as many of them as we can, and distribute it to, to the folks who listened in. So thanks a lot, and so Sam, to you.
Thanks, Lou. So we will be following up with everyone who attended today with an email. Um, we'll send you a link to the recording and the slides, and we will try to follow up with you about some of the questions that we weren't able to get to. Um, in the meantime, you can find more information about us on our website, uh, Clean Energy Group's website. Uh, it's resilient-power.org for more information. Thanks, everybody.